and uh, the Friday Five and full gear here today with the uh, Admiral Bill Stubblefield. Good hey. morning, Rob. Good morning, Good gentlemen. Mr. Michael Hyde, Delegate at Large. Good morning. Larry Schultz, Attorney at Law. Great to be here, Rob. How's that cough? Well, it's it comes and goes. Yeah. The tie with Larry today. He looks all dressed up. Yeah, it's once in a while. I got to mm-hmm. do it. Mm-hmm. Are you going to court as the plaintiff or the defendant? Probably as the plaintiff. It's the probable. Huh? Yeah. Well, I mean, I could get arrested <laughs> in the parking lot. He has, he has, made up his, has uh, not made up his <laughs> mind yet. He goes either way. <laughs> when I go on vacation, I always call back, and my first question is, have I been indicted? <laughs> I have the staff watching the papers. You know, that, that, that was a big question in my family routinely, as a matter of fact. So we always asked it with a hand over the mouth like that. As a lip reader. But, you know, you have your own reasons why you do yours. Uh, also, New York Times bestselling author John Gilstrap. Good morning. And via telephone, Joe, Joey Torts Ferretti. Good morning, Joseph. Well, good morning. Larry and I are going to be standing uh out in front of the courthouse this morning, and we go to the highest bidder, playing it for defendant. That's right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. Before we get started, yes, I understand sir. Mike Height is to be criticized. Because. Uh, because. Why not? Because, why yeah, not? Why not? Why not? Yeah, that's but not news. By, by giving <laughs> Hornby a saw without operating instructions. <laughs> that's no. a good point. Oh, no. You know, 10, it, it? 10, 15 years ago, I would have came with the saw. But when he what? asked, can I borrow your saw? Yes, whatever you're doing, just do it. I'm, I don't come with it yeah. anymore. It is the rumor but you should that, have. You should have. Is there the rumor that he was cutting off a legal monitoring device? Uh, is that kind of new leg? I cannot confirm. I cannot deny. <laughs> You, you might want to fill in everybody, Rob. What's going that's, on. that's why I didn't come with the song. I can't take part in any activity Hornby, like that. Hornby was, uh, Mike Carl can't make it because this is his usual second Friday. And Alonzo Perry, who's his default stand-in, was unable to make it as well today, too. And Mike had initially been scheduled to be the co-host. And he said, but if you can get somebody... Please do. Mike sent us a picture of his legs after he finished knocking out some drywall and sheetrock, I guess. And uh, he had borrowed Mr. Height's reciprocal saw. And after seeing the pictures, my question to him was, you know you're not supposed to use that on your own leg, don't you? <laughs> and so, as the, as the guy a, who was sitting in for Mike Hornby, I'm yes. pleased to announce a 20% raise for everyone <laughs> here at the station. I always liked you, John. I've always liked you. Gentlemen! You may or may not know this, but uh, a couple of things occurred today in history, one of which is the sinking of the Titanic. Right? Today's the day it struck the iceberg 111 years ago today. But in addition to that, this is also the anniversary of the first motion picture. And as a result... And I was not there, Mike. <laughs> Bill was out front going, that'll be a dime, that'll be a dime. No two for one on my watch. So uh, as a result of this, as a theme today, I have tried to match a movie and an actor to you as part of your themed introduction. And before we go far, I suspect I'm Lou Costello. <laughs> suspect all you wish. Soon you will find out. So here we go. 129 years ago today, they rolled out the first ever motion picture movie. And while those first few were silent, later they added sound, and that was pretty groovy. They made all sorts of films, some great and some not so good, made with stars who can act and some who wish they could. But of all the films I thought would pass the Larry Schultz test, All the President's Men, where Dustin Hoffman got Nixon, was the one that fit the best. <laughs> I think you're right. And, and, and to those of you watching live on TV and following along on Facebook, Dylan Bishop has uh, done the wonderful job of putting up Larry Schultz's doppelganger, Dustin Hoffman, with a beard and glasses. And I think you're about to see that roll in there. Now, there you go. Yes. <laughs> I counseled him very closely on that. I said the white beard is going to be a good thing. And, and does, uh, Dylan, could you cut right to Larry Schultz out of that picture on a solo shot so we can get the audience comparison there? Yeah. <laughs> huh? That's pretty good. That's, that's pretty close. That's yeah. pretty good. I right, bring up the Mike Height one for us now, uh, Dylan, if you oh, would. Lord. When you're looking for a film that matches best with Michael Height, you've got to make certain that you've got the film that fits just right. It's not a rom-com with Jennifer Aniston, nor an action pick with Tom Cruise, although that bartender one cocktail might have fit what with all that booze. Nope, I've got to go with a cranky actor, one not exactly a pup. And for that, I've got to go with Ed Asner as the old man in the movie up. 
<laughs> and there you go. <laughs> There's a real watch you, sir, Mike. How nervous are you, Bill? I'm, I'm, I'm leaving. I'm leaving. How nervous are you, Bill? I know this, this next one for John Gilstrap, I, I don't, it's touching, I think, more than anything else. You've got to be careful when you're casting for a movie with John Gilstrap because of everybody in the room, he's the only one who's written screenplays and endured a copyright mishap. So it can't just be any movie. No, indeed, not just any flick. It's got to be a feel-good thriller, not one that makes you sick. So for this, I've searched far and wide to match this perfectly, and I've gone with the storyteller, Richard Dreyfus in the movie Stand By Me. Uh, All right. I, okay, I, I don't actually object to that one. Yeah, <laughs> wow. There you go. There you go. I think that's a good movie. All right, Mr. Ferretti, you're up. Oh, you know what? Boy. For, for yours, i got to go this way, okay? <laughs> For this next one, I've got to admit it wasn't particularly hard to find the right movie and play the Italian card. It was easy to find the actor and the movie to fit my man Joe. There are many mob movies he made, and always with that silver flow. He was Billy Batts who made that fatal mistake, dooming the end of the silver fox. For Joe Ferretti, it's Frankie Vincent and Goodfellas who shouldn't have mentioned that shine box. <laughs> There you go, Torts. Yeah. There you go, you Torts. Know, this, 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 this needs to be behind a paywall. <laughs> there you go. There you go. All right. How many, I like this music enough. I'm going to keep it up there for the, uh, the next one here. Oh, but I'm going to wait. I'll have to go back because I'm going to run out of music on that one. So here we go. The final one, of course. When you're matching an admiral, you've got to mind his seafaring ways. And the actors you match must have his matching grays. And it's got to be a grand vessel, remembered today and throughout time. And I've got to find a way to make it all into a rhyme. So for Bill Stubblefield, I've chosen a movie that gave us Leo. What a thrill! And of course, that's the Titanic, which sank on this day. And the actor who played Captain Smith, Bernard Hill. Huh? I was hoping for the skipper. <laughs> Or Gilligan. Or, 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 yeah. Hey, thanks, Rob. I'll go with Gilligan. Let, you, you, did, you did good, Rob. You did good. Let, let me tell you why it wasn't Alan Hale, because it was there. Believe me. <laughs> but technically, Gilligan's Island is not a movie. Yeah. Sure enough. At the theater. Should be, now, now it was a TV movie yeah. in the end, but this was mo this was motion picture movie yeah. implying theater. It's the only reason why Alan Hale didn't make the cut, <laughs> because he was on the tip of the tongue. And McHale's Navy, same way. <laughs> Ernest Borgnine. <Yes. Fortnite. laughs> yeah. Ernest Borgnine. But since the Titanic you know, hit the yeah. iceberg on this date, yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and the actor's much better looking. So he, the, we're, we're on par. That's we're a distinguished par, yeah. man there, Bernard Hill. Very yeah. distinguished. Very distinguished. <laughs> Mr. Ferretti, you lead us off. Oh, how do I follow this? <laughs> All right. So, uh, Rob, Mike Hornby, a couple weeks ago, posed a question to the panel about whether there's a danger of the West Virginia legislature going too far. And that got me thinking and, and actually looking up uh, some of the acts, some of the very recent conduct of state legislatures across the country. And I think Mike is really on to something that we should all be concerned about. In Montana, they are currently proposing a law that is going to change how they elect a U.S. senator because we know that's a big race coming up with Senator John Tester being the incumbent. They're going to change the way they elect a U.S. senator, and then right after the election, the law is going to sunset and re revert back to the way they've always elected a U.S. senator just to achieve a result in this one election. In Wisconsin, the legislature is now considering impeachment of a recently elected West, or state, I'm sorry, a state Supreme Court justice in Wisconsin, who hasn't been sworn in yet. In Georgia, the legislature passed a law creating a prosecuting attorney oversight commission so that the legislature will look over the shoulder of elected prosecuting attorneys throughout the state to make sure, quote, they're doing the job correctly. In Texas, we have a legislature that created a law 
that now empowers private citizens to sue doctors and anyone else who aids and abets the performance of an abortion and provides an economic incentive where you can win $10,000 or more if you win your case. In Missouri, in a race to see who can have the most liberal gun laws in the country, the legislature voted last year to invalidate all federal gun laws that violate the U.S. Constitution, and this year, just recently, rejected an amendment that would restrict gun ownership and gun carrying by minors, people who are 12, 13, 14 years old. In the state of Missouri today, if you're that age, you can carry. So as I see these things happening, and all of these happening uh, in the past few weeks, I'm wondering if we are in an era of real extremism at the state legislative level. And if this is all related to gerrymandering, where these elected officials now have to play to their political base and that the most important elections they're ever going to face are primaries versus general elections. Is that what we have wrought with gerrymandering in this country? And is it a real problem to be concerned about? And what, if anything, can we do about it? All right. Let's uh, start with John Gilstrap. Let's put him on the hot seat right away. John? Well, gerrymandering is, has been, has, is as old as the nation. It, it's what legislatures do and in order to draw a congressional district. So that in itself is not the problem. Activism is not itself the problem. The problem, I think, and it, it affects, it's across the board. It goes to gun violence. It goes to you know, all the body politic right now is very angry. It's very partisan. People's feelings are hurt. Few people feel cheated. Um, if there's a, in, in the in the examples you cited, there there are some that are actually driven, you know, by in, enforcement measures. You know, if we're going to outlaw abortion, I'm going to get into the deep, you know, that as an issue. But the the Texas law is a way to to keep people from from skirting the law. Is that good? Is that bad? That's that's. I guess that depends on whose ox is being gored. But the. Um, I, I think, in general, the political discourse in America is totally out of control. It is so wildly partisan. Gone are the days that a Democrat and Republican can be toward the middle and survive uh, a primary fight. Or if if Mike Height is a, is a Republican and I'm a Democrat and we are seen at, at the national level, I don't think it's necessarily at the state level, but if, if, if we're seen at the national level having polite discourse, People are going to throw primaries at us, and that means the, the compromise is gone. We, we've reached this odd sense of activism as a way of shutting up the other side, and all that does is it drives people to the mattresses, right? And and it, we have such a bifurcated body politic right now that I I fear for the future of the country. I certainly fear for any sense of of moderation. In, in politics. So, yeah, I think it's a problem, but I don't, I don't lay it at the feet of gerrymandering. I lay it at the feet of, of an angry public. Bill Stumblefield. Yeah, I, as always, Joe, I marvel and I'm impressed how well you lay out an issue. Uh, you do it with a lot of examples, a lot of statistics, and it's, and, and I'm not, I'm hard pressed to really rebut that. Uh, I agree with John Gilstrap. Uh, I don't think it's solely gerrymandering. I do think gerrymandering is uh, uh, plays a role. Uh, starting back in the mid 1990s, uh, there was a uh, uh, there was a greater emphasis starting in Texas and then it spread to other countries. I, I, using gerrymandering as a more severe political tool than it had been before then. And ever since the mid-1990s, it has been, that tool has been sharpened, and it is a, uh, uh, it is a problem, I think. Uh, John's point about having a, a, 
a Democrat and a Republican shoulder to shoulder appearing to be working together. An extreme example of this, the Stubblefield Institute a couple of years ago, a few years ago, gave a civility award to a House of Representative uh, member, Republican and Democrat. Their role was trying to pull the two sides closer and closer together. Well, the Republican is no longer a member of the House. He was replaced by Marjorie Taylor Greene. So that kind of drives the point home that it's uh, you, uh, in, in John's point, John Gilscrap's point is well made. Uh, we are in a real pickle right now. Uh, and we're seeing it manifested on so many fronts, so many fronts. Uh, and literally to, to the, and this is not an extreme example, if, uh, and we're seeing it with President uh, Trump, uh, that the Republicans are rallying behind President Trump regardless of what he says or what he does. We have the same thing on the, uh, uh, the Democratic side with President Biden. Uh, the re Democrats are rallying behind him. We sit with gun control. We have two separate issues. One side is totally in favor of more gun control. The other side is invoking the Second Amendment. You can't, you can't touch my guns. We're finding this on everything we do. How, how much farther can this rubber band be scratched before it ruptures? I don't know. But we are sure scratching rubber, the rubber band. Thank you, Bill. And I would like to implore the panelists to please not make uh, mention of food during your remaining <laughs> arguments, as I haven't eaten since six o'clock yesterday. And uh, Bill, you mentioned the word pickle there. I'd like I to did. once again remind you that that goes with a nice, tasty rules. club sandwich on the there side, rules. which makes my stomach growl. So, going forward, Larry, do you have any food references in your arguments? You're about not to? not that I've already prepared, but <laughs> thank you. It could always slip in. Me being who I am. Um, look, I think, nationally at least, with the National Congress, where the gerrymandering is controlled more by the federal government's courts uh, than, say, state-level gerrymandering uh, is, you know, is not so uh, uh, controlled by the feds, um, I think that there is a remedy in this, and we saw a glimpse of it in 2022. Remember, the Republicans were in the year when they should have rolled and built some big majorities in both houses of Congress. Didn't happen. There's an, another election, uh, a presidential, but then there is also a, a, congressional, a series of congressional elections in 2024. What we've seen in Nashville recently and what we uh, are probably going to see going forward in Louisville is young people stepping up and making more and more noise about some of these issues like abortion and guns. And I think there is a chance that this time the Republicans, uh, last time was the Democrats' bad year because they had a lot of people um, um, at up, risk up for who, who, might, who might lose. This time it switches to the Republicans. Uh, they're facing a lot of uh, candidates uh, senators and so forth who are up uh, for a six-year term. And if there's a similar surge like in 2022, then at least at the national level, we will see a correction that perhaps sends a signal to the Marjorie Taylor Greens. You know, you're going to have to back off this, this show that you're putting on every week because we need some serious legislating done. Um, I I hope that's what happens. Obviously, I'm a Democrat, so I would hope it anyway. But I think that is the cure. As for the state-level stuff, we are a long ways away. And I mean, I, even uh, Republican legislators I've spoken to from West Virginia say, you know, there's uh, two parts to that party that's running everything in West Virginia. And some of those folks are pretty far out there. And so... It always happens when one party controls because there has to be contention. But um, I'm not so sure on the state level it could be a problem for a long time. But I think there's a fix in, in the works for the feds. Delegate Michael Hines. 
Uh, when it comes to gerrymandering, I'd have to agree with John. I don't think there's a real issue there. It's as old as, as our, our Constitution. We've been gerrymandering lines forever. Um, and there is some oversight to it. We've seen the, the past uh, election when, when lines were gerrymandered. It went to the courts. The courts said, no, you can't do that. You're going to have to go back to, you know. But this is supposed to be a legislative type function. But the courts got involved and said, no, you can't do that. You have to, you have to fix that. Um, so there is some oversight. And I think that's sometimes where the point for the legislature comes from when it comes to the courts. You know, they want some oversight. You know, we we make the laws. It's your job to enforce them. And they want some oversight over the, the, the judges to say you, you can't pick and choose which laws you enforce once we pass them. So I think that's sort of the give and take you see um, with the legislature and, and the court system. As far as some of the other stuff, you know, I think in an effort to be transparent, um, we may have gone too far. And I say that was sort of tongue in cheek because what I'm, what I'm saying is in order to be transparent, we put cameras everywhere within within the, the body of the legislature. And you see, and I'll use Tennessee as an example, how do people react how do people behave when there's a camera on them? And I think a lot, of, you know, the legislature has rules of conduct and how you're supposed to, you have to be recognized. You have, there's, there's formality in that whole, whole uh, thing. And, and those individuals in Tennessee didn't follow. There was no decorum. They were very disruptive. It was allowed to go on to a, a certain point and then they were issued from the room, much like what happened in West Virginia this year in the Senate side. You can only go, you can only be disruptive to a certain degree, and then it is, is the job of the body to remove you from that situation so they can continue with the work at hand. Now, as far as them being expelled. ousted, expelled from that organization, again, that, that comes down to debate on the floor and it's up to that body to make that decision a and they did you know we've had similar I can tell you being in the legislature I have spoken with certain legislatures and they are much different when the cameras rolling than when it's not but my comment to both of them, uh, West Virginia and uh, Tennessee was that they were not been they were not recognized by the chair and they they had their mics turned off so they had no way of making their point known. Uh, and right, in which we have rules. So w you have to be recognized. Now, but if you're not been recognized, what recourse do you have, Mike? But you still can't stand up and and, and throw but, a but, hissy fit. But if you if you have if you're not been recognized, what recourse do you have? Why aren't you being recognized? How, were you recognized before? Are there other people being recognized? Are they? You know, I don't know what the issue was in Tennessee. I know what the issue was in West Virginia. Um, that that senator said from the get, very get go what his intentions were, which is why he wasn't recognized. He was trying to be disruptive. And his supposedly he had rehearsed that the night before with some of his colleagues. And, and um, told all of his yeah, colleagues what was going yeah, to happen. We're talking about Robert Carnes here. Exactly. Right. We're Correct. talking about uh, West Virginia and yes. not Tennessee. Correct. He did yep. not get kicked out of the Senate. We should be very clear to yeah. say. No, he didn't he, get kicked out. He, he got rid of public he, office. He got like removed that day. Were. Um, but but came back. He did not get removed from office. And when we look at when Tennessee's legislature has been faced with other disruptions and other uh, sort of uh, uh, untoward behavior by its members, this seems what these three did, or these two did who got expelled, seems fairly small in comparison to the stuff that got overlooked in the past. And even though we're not Tennesseans, we have the right as Americans to look at that and say, wait, wait, wait a minute. Sure. Uh, the, you know, the, the, they threw this guy out for this, but they didn't throw this guy out for that, uh, this other thing. And, and we get a chance to weigh that and wonder 
what would we do if that was our state? Well, and race played an issue in that uh, as well uh, because it was two black males who were expelled and one white female who came one vote short of being expelled. So that obviously became another part of that issue. They made it a race issue after the fact. I'm not sure it was a race issue up front. They, the reason the speaker gave was that the lady, the white lady, did not use the bullhorn whereas the two black fellows did use the bullhorn. But they were very, the three of them, very quick to evoke race. This all comes back to the lack of civil discussion, civil discourse. You can't bring a, a bullhorn into a legislative session and, and think that you're justified to do that. There, ha, there is a, a process of polite debate. It's not always satisfying because there are, I don't know if there are, um, there are timers on how long people can speak or, or whatever. This, the legislative process, debate, civil d discussion is frustrating because not everybody is, is going to change their minds. That does not justify a temper tantrum. Well, it's, we are in overtime in the first session. That's uh, a compliment to you, Joe Ferretti, and it also comes back to you for the final word. Well, I, of course, I agree with, with Mike and John. The gerrymander has been around for a long time. But as the judge sitting in North Carolina stated in reviewing a North Carolina gerrymandered district, with computer modeling these days, it can be done with remarkable precision. And while we're getting very good at gerrymandering, the court review of gerrymandering is becoming less and less, uh, as we saw with the invalidation of certain sections of the Voting Rights Act which allowed courts to review how certain districts were gerrymandered. So I think we've got forces working in opposite directions here, and I think that's a danger for the country going forward as we see these legislatures playing to their base versus doing the public good. Our Friday Five is here, and in full gear, Joe Joe Torts for ready via telephone. Joseph, welcome back. Good morning. Excellent opening topic, as always. That's why you're the leadoff hitter. And uh, with issue number two, the Admiral... Bill Stubblefield. Rob, I think there are two issues in front of us today that divide us more than any other. One is abortion. The second is gun, gun control, gun violence. Since the beginning of this year, we've had 146 mass shootings. A mass shooting is identified of where four or more people are either killed or injured. Uh, if you look at what we've done the last few years, in 2020, we had 610 mass shootings. Compared to 20, uh, about four years earlier, we had 273. So 2020, 610. 2021, 690. 2022, 647. And we're on a trend this year to make it even even larger than that. Uh, we've seen it recently in Nashville. We've seen it recently in Louisville. I have two questions, uh, basically one question split in two parts. Uh, can we solve the nation's gun violence problem, and how can we solve it? Or the, and the second question is, will we even try? All right, there's the question. It's a two-part question, and uh, I'm going to start with Larry Schultz on this first. Larry. I think that solve, depending on what you mean by that, I don't think we can eradicate it uh, completely. But there are certainly things we can do uh, that will uh, reduce the incidence of this. Um, Nineteen states, uh, as another panelist noted in uh, some of the uh, stuff we talked about, uh, 19 states have red flag laws. Some of those are very good. Uh, I work in domestic battery intervention. There is a strong reason why. Um Families that are broken apart by violence should not have access to guns. Um, families that are broken apart by violence uh, conducted without weapons uh, do not improve and do not get safer for the children involved or anyone else when guns are introduced. And so we do have, in a lot of states, requirements where if you're under a domestic battery uh, order, for example, a safety order, you must give up your guns for the period of that order. Uh, I believe that's still the statute in West Virginia. Um, if you're not going to do that kind of simple thing, then no one's really paying attention to the kind of um, anguish and turmoil that's going on in certain heads in every community. And it, to the extent that we're providing not just weapons 
but weapons of war to these people uh, so that they can shoot 30 rounds in an unbelievably short time, as a young man did in the bank in Louisville the other day. We're just not even pretending uh, to do anything about this. We need better mental health screening. We need more funds for mental health intervention and other uh, things like that. But until we take the weapons away from people who are homicidal, suicidal, and and that sort of thing, we're going to have an uphill fight. Mike Height. <clears throat> um, this is a this is a tough one, and you know you you talk a little bit about red flag laws, and I have I have a big problem with red flag laws. I don't think that um, most people are giving the, their their due process when it comes to red flag laws. That you can have someone call in, and I can call in and report you, Larry, uh, for for something. And they come and take your guns, no questions asked, and then you have to prove your innocence. Well, that's not sort of how the, the whole system is supposed to work. So that's the, one of the big problems I have with red flag laws. Now, if there is a, a domestic battery issue, like you say, and, and police are called, I don't have a problem with taking guns away from those individuals when there is clear evidence that there is a domestic issue there um, and it, it didn't have anything to do with the weapons in particular at that particular time. Or, or even if it did, did or didn't, you can see that there's a, a battery issue, a violent issue there, and maybe, or if you can see that there's a mental health issue, uh, I don't have a problem with it. But I think there has to be some kind of due process when it comes to red flag laws, when you're just going to come in and arbitrarily take somebody's right away from them um, with, without due process. So I think you have to work that out um, in order for that uh, to work. Um, and it's because guns are an inherent right. It's written into our Constitution. You know, the, the right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. So. I, I think that's – I don't think we're going to be able to solve the gun issue very easily. Um, you know, you can look back to the Wild West, and it was similar in a lot of ways back then. I hope we're not getting back to the Wild West, but it seems like we are in some regards. Um, I, I see talk about how do we make areas, certain areas, more safe, schools, campuses, all those types of things. Um I don't know that the answer is just more security guards. Um, a, a lot of times it is you allow individuals to protect themselves. And I think a lot of these mass shootings happen in gun-free zones um, where it allows mass shooters to come in and know that there's not going to be anybody that's going to be able to stand up to them. So I uh, that, that's one of the reasons I think SB 10 passed in the legislature this year is because um, they didn't want the gun-free zones. They wanted people to be able to defend themselves. Now, what's a gun-free zone in Louisville? What's a gun-free zone in Tennessee? Neither one of those were declared gun-free uh, zones, I, I, especially I didn't, Louisville. I, I didn't say all. I said many. And but you, that, you look but, at these campuses. You look at these school shootings. These are all gun-free zones. And, and they, they tend to happen in those areas a lot. All right. Now, next up, Bill, you, if this is your topic. Uh, actually, we you not finish the other two? No, I'm not done yet. Okay. No, no. I'm, I'm fine. Okay. <laughs> no, I, you, you had interjected. And I, I didn't know, know if you had I, more. And I was just asking a question. All right. Fair enough. I'll ask the questions. And, yeah. uh, <laughs> Your place, Ouch. Ouch. I don't come on your boat and tell you how to steer it. Well, I'm not doing that bad. right, Bill. you got to take those waves on at a different angle. You never heard me do that. Now, let's go to Joe Toy. Joe, Joey Toy, it's ready next. Go, Joe. Well, there's two truisms here that I see regarding guns. One is ownership is a fundamental right, so we've got to work around that. But when the citizens abuse that right, and they show that they're uh, incapable of keeping the peace and tranquility, and they threaten us to an extent that uh, we're not secure in our persons or our property, which is also in the Constitution, then safeguards have to be considered. Uh, we, we impose restrictions on all of our Bill of Rights, all of them. 
and they're, they're not unfettered. They're, they're not uh, so sacrosanct that we can't regulate some of the rights that we have. We do it all the time. And with regard to these uh, extreme risk protection orders or red flag laws, whatever you want to call them, we have a laboratory right now where we can examine how they're working in these 19 states. And the reports I'm seeing is, despite fears to the contrary, they're not being abused. You know, people aren't just causing problems by reporting on other people. That's not happening. And what I do see, though, is that gun violence, whether it's suicides or whether it's people who intend to harm or maim others, there are some interdictions that are working. In the last couple shootings we've had, reports came out immediately that family and friends were concerned about the shooter and had made reports prior to the event. I have to believe that we can concoct a judicial framework here, a court oversight that guarantees due process rights to anyone who has their gun confiscated because of a valid report that that individual is acting uh, in a strange way or a dangerous way. And a lot of these red flag laws, hearings are held within 48 hours before you're before a judge uh, explaining why the petition has been filed and whether or not the individual should still be denied their guns. I think that is a good due process from, framework that we can have to ensure everybody has their rights and their guns returned if they were uh, needlessly confiscated. But the point is we have to do something to try to interdict here and, and to maybe save some lives. And, and I think that can be done and we can have a balanced approach to this that's going to help uh, the citizens of this country feel that they are safe in their, their person and property. John Gilstrap. As is often the case in political discourse, I think that we're asking the wrong questions at the wrong time. Um, we don't solve the nation's obesity problem by regulating forks. Uh, the guns are the tool of, of murder in many cases, not all cases. Uh, but they are not the problem. It's, it, there are hundreds of millions of Americans who own hundreds of millions of guns that never shoot anybody. And so we need to ask the question, what's the common denominator? What are the common denominators? And they have to be them um, uh, among the shooters. I think the common denominator is anger or just malice. You know, there are miscreants out there. Look at, you know, Chicago loses hundreds of people every weekend, or not loses them, but hundreds of people get shot in Chicago every weekend. The prosecutions out there are low. New York City, the prosecutions, the gun violent, gun uh, crime, People who commit gun crimes are routinely not indicted and, and not, not jailed. So part of the problem is let's start enforcing the laws that are already there. Um, I will tell you that I may or may not own a firearm, but if I did, I will have gone through a lot of paperwork and a background check to make sure that I can have it. If I have a concealed carry permit, that's yet another uh, investigation that I have to go through. So we have stop gaps that are built into the current laws that legal gun ownership can be, nobody can legally own a gun outside of very rare circumstances. There, nobody can legally own a gun without having been approved to, to do so, without having passed a background check. And remember, this is a fundamental right, which doesn't mean that it's something that is granted by the government. It is a right with which we are born. So the red flag laws, well, I don't, I, I worry about a fundamental right being denied someone on the basis of a rumor, an upset girlfriend or an upset boyfriend who says, hey, you know, my, my, I, I just want to, I just want to hurt them. If, however, we have red flag laws, and I have not researched the, the details of red flag laws, so I, I'm, I'm kind of on, on the surface of all of this. But if we have red flag laws that are drawn with the same level of stop gaps that we have for a Fourth Amendment violation or for a Fourth Amendment uh, search, you know, we have to get a judge involved up front and it has to be, there, there are certain steps that the authorities have to go through in order to search my home for specific things. If we have that level built into red flag laws, I can live with them. Although understand that at that moment we are denying a fundamental right to a citizen to have the guns. 
But the real discussion needs to be on the source of anger. The young people in America don't get to, and this, not open up another Pandora's box here, but we are all of a certain age, or we are all within the same sleeve of age, where we settled schoolyard issues with a schoolyard fight. And the schoolyard fight, those are bad. Somebody gets hurt, but lessons are learned. And we learned early on to adjudicate things among ourselves. Kids these days always have an adult present. They don't learn how to, um, how to handle disputes among their peers. And then if they do act out, then the, the oppressor and the defender are treated equally. I had a, it's a long story, my, my son's background, a kid poured, poured a pint of milk over Brent's head. Brent got up and popped the kid because he got milk poured over his head, and Brent was the one who was expelled because he used violence. So I think there are so many issues in terms of perverted senses of, just, of justice and, and abandonment by authority figures and zero tolerance, and that's, that's the root of the anger. If we can get to the root of the anger, we get to the root of the violence problem. And this started off, by the way, with John stating that we're not asking the right questions, and I blame you for that, Bill, because this was your issue. <laughs> yeah. And, and I was trying to help Mike sharpen his point, and I was chastised. <laughs> and so I'll be quiet. I'll never say another word on the show. The Rob. final word is yours before yeah. you take that battle of silence. Right. Yeah. Okay. Monk yeah. Stubblefield. Uh, there were, if you remember, there were two parts of my question. Can we solve the gun violence? And the second part is will we even try? And I think today's discussion answers the second question. To issue number three, we go to Delegate Michael Height. Well, I'm going to go to a totally different topic, um, get out of politics for a second. Well, it might be politics, who knows. Um, and, and let's talk about sports a little bit. Um, and I want to know, is baseball better with the new time rules than it was before? The pitcher is on a timer. The batter can't take timeouts all the time. The, the game has sped up. And will people start watching Major League Baseball again? All right. I'm, I will I will not usually part of the people who answer questions, but my answer is one word, and the answer is yes. Uh, so let me go uh, to Joe. Joey Torts, ready to lead off the baseball discussion. Joe. Well, uh, Rob, I'm in uh, full-throated agreement with you. Yes, it is a good thing. Uh, baseball games this season are averaging about 30 minutes shorter in duration than they did last year. That's a significant amount of time uh, when the baseball games were running over three hours last year. Unwatchable on television. And if you're in the stadium, uh, I, I don't know what you do except just continue to down hot dogs and beer. So the funny thing about the rule is that baseball teams are learning that uh, cutting off beer sales and the sixth inning or seventh inning now is costing them money because the games are shorter. So now they want to extend to the eighth inning the uh, amount of time you can buy a beer. So I thought that was an interesting sidetrack to all this. But <laughs> yes. I think baseball, baseball sort of needed Im improvement on time. And, and this rule, I applaud it uh, as much as I can. And let's hear it for those oppressed, downtrodden baseball owners of teams who don't have enough money that they need to milk a few more <laughs> beer dollars at the expense of innocent lives on the highway <laughs> who could be maimed and shot down all in the anger of sucking down a few more brews because your team blew it in the bottom of the ninth inning. <laughs> Billy Stubblefield. Yeah. Uh, and the Tampa Bay Rays would agree with you, Joe. It's a, it's a better game now. They don't lose. They don't lose. That's right, yeah. No, I, I think it's simple. I, I agree. I'm not a great professional baseball fan but i do watch occasionally much more enjoyable this year than was previous years all right the man who knows more about sports than anybody i've ever met john gilstrap <laughs> as bill and rob know i i live for professional sports i dedicate whole moments of my life to it every year well, you mean moment <laughs> moment whole moment of, of my life you know it's funny i we we share possible ideas the night before, you know, so that we can talk about these things. And I've been sitting here and think, any question but that? Any question but that? Any question but that? <laughs> so, so I defer to Rob and say, yes. Smart. <laughs> Larry Schultz. Um, I've never liked baseball. I don't. I played it as a kid. I liked it then. But watching baseball to me is 
wasting time. <laughs> I don't, I, there's no other way for me to put it. And so if they were to continue, if I happen to end up at a baseball game, which I occasionally do go, um, I, I and they let me continue to drink after the sixth inning, there could be trouble. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, you know, it, I think there are a lot of people like me. Even with the speed up, I watched part of a ball game the other day, and it was like, what are we doing here? Come on, come on. It, there's not enough, and the, the reason Action. I don't watch baseball, yeah. there's not enough excitement minute to minute. Um, I don't know, in a football game, it seems like that big running back gets one little crease of daylight, he's gone. And that's the exciting part for me. Um uh, watching the quarterback getting getting hammered is also a big fun. You mean after the me. seventh inning? <laughs> no, <that>? no, no. <laughs> getting hammered by defensive linemen, not alcohol. Wasn't people. sure what you meant. <laughs> well, I know you're a Ben Roethlisberger fan. <laughs> yes, sir. <so. laughs> <laughs> well, any event, I I I don't I don't watch enough of it to to be able to tell whether it's a good idea or not. Um, there's nothing about baseball that's a particularly good idea for me. I, so. I think what Larry's saying, he likes to keep trimming time off the game until it's when it's over before it even starts. <laughs> that's not a bad idea. Yeah. That's not a bad idea at all. <laughs> you should at least go forward until people like Rob say, okay, you went too far. You went too then far. you back up a little bit and you've, you've hit the happy medium. I Give think me about 20 minutes. When you <laughs> 20 minute game. We're playing a quadruple header today. The uh, game that you saw over the last de devolved into what recently became standard four-hour games when the Yankees would play the Red Sox wasn't always there. I remember, and I've told the story before, uh, during the pandemic, jumping on top of the elliptical machine or the, the you know, getting on the treadmill and putting on YouTube and clicking an old game from the 1971 Orioles-Pirates World Series. It was game six, and I'm watching that game. And uh, I, I couldn't understand it. What was going on? They, I thought maybe they edited it, but they didn't. It was live as it was televised uh, that day. And they would, the pitcher would get the ball back from the catcher. He'd look in. He'd shake his head yes or no, throw the ball, strike ball, throw it back to the pitcher. He'd look in, get the sign again, batters in the box, throw it again. Every 20 seconds, they were chucking another pitch down there. And I, I watched four innings in about 40 minutes. And I thought, what, what happened to the game that was 1971? Where did that go? And it, and it kind of, I think it first came to my consciousness with the Moneyball and Billy Bean talking about we want to we want to work that pitch count, yeah. we want to work that pitch count, want to get into their bullpen. So by the end of the series, you're facing their tenth best pitcher. And it became about running up the pitch count as opposed to there's a bat in your hand, swing it every now and then. Yeah, that point's driven home if you ever try to watch a monitor game on ESPN on your iPad, and all it shows is a strike. And it seems like you go for 15 minutes between <laughs> one strike and the next strike. You're not diverted with all the other background information. You're just looking, waiting for the next strike, and it never comes about. It's just never there. I want to talk first and foremost about the only octogenarian in the room dropping iPads on us here during this baseball <laughs> conversation. <laughs> Could, went, that could be a sign that there's just about to be a giant technical breakthrough in America. Huh? Huh? Way to go, Larry. Way to go. That was not nice at all. Did you have something, John? Yeah, I'm just curious. If we're, if we're going to be timing the pitcher, does that give a lot of power to the batter to stay out of the batter's box for longer? While he's he can't. No, because that's a rule as well. As well. Okay. That's been changed, yeah. yeah. And if you don't abide by the time rules, it's a ball. And it doesn't matter if it's the bottom of the ninth on a 3-2 count. If the game's decided that way, and they're, they're sticking to it, and I applaud them for that. Mike, final word is yours. Well, as somebody who used to watch baseball quite often uh, and stopped for a, a myriad of reasons, and this being one of them, it, mm -hmm. it just went on too long. I, I'm glad to see Major League Baseball has finally recognized this and is taking steps to try to get their viewership back up and to make games more enjoyable. If they could just get a salary cap, uh, I may even start watching baseball again, but I, I'm glad to see this this first step. Amen. And purists, purists hate this, but I think this is good for the game. Purists are wrong because the purest game of baseball was the one I was watching in 1971. I agree. I agree. Not the mess that became the 20s, 2000s. I do think they should create a steroid league, though, where those are legal, because I would love to bring that back. Where Those games would be fascinating. 47-42 <laughs> in the bottom of the second. That was his fourth 600-foot homer of the day. Yeah. yeah.
When you got two heads, remember you can get a ball and a strike on both pitches. <laughs> the leader of issue number four, Larry Schultz. Yes, um, as many of you know, I live in Morgan County, the home of Cacapin State Park, and there is currently a proposal by a company called Blue Water LLC to build 350 recreational vehicle campsites at the upper lake or in the vicinity of the upper lake, for those of you who are familiar with it. And there's quite a, a dispute going on. Uh, there are other proposals of fewer uh, spaces by other companies. Um, public hearings are coming up. Um, and my question is, do you think that those who wish to put 350 RV sites in Cape and State Park will succeed. And this was enabled by legislation passed in the previous legislative session, if I recall. That then. is correct. I think in the pre-height era. In the you, yeah, directly before. <laughs> <laughs> you can't blame this on my kite. We would like to, though. <laughs> well, <laughs> let's go to my kite right now and see how he would have voted two sessions ago. So there was legislation this past session as well that addressed this very issue, and Mike Height was in favor of it, um, that every park in West Virginia is sold out to capacity for RVs in those parks through this year. They are in desperate need of expansion if we are going to attract tourism dollars, which is exactly what this does to our state parks, that they there are people that want to come to West Virginia and enjoy our natural beauty and, and the things we have here in West Virginia and spend their dollars here. And that is one of the things that our tourism board has tried to push and they have been very successful and this is just the next logical step in that it is not just cape and state park it is every park in west virginia is trying to get dollars for expansion right now and the majority of them are for expansion of rv parks the the rv sites within those parks cape and state park just went through millions of dollars worth of renovation to accommodate uh, with a new hotel and, and lots of upgrades. This is just the next step in that process. And, and like I said, every state park in West Virginia is going through this process right now. I, I am absolutely in favor of this, whether it needs to be 350 or 150 or whatever the number is, that I, I would be willing to debate. Um, but should this happen? Absolutely, this should happen. Mr. Stubblefield? Yeah, I know nothing about the issue other than when my wife read about this a couple so days ago, she went on a 15-minute rant. That would have made Rob Mario proud. All right. <laughs> but but I, I don't know enough about the issue to respond. Wait, that great comedic buildup and there's no no answer? <laughs> no, I, well, my, wife, my wife knew enough to respond. <laughs> Can we get the missus on the phone? Yes. <laughs> And I don't think she agreed with you, Mike. <laughs> John Gilstrap. Issues like this are are always so confusing. Yes, we need the tourism dollars, but yes, we also want to maintain the beauty and the bucolic nature of the national parks. Going from zero to 350 seems aggressive to me, and I, I think about, I'm not entirely sure where this, I know the area, um, the roads aren't the best. Uh, it's they're, not they're, zero. I just want to correct you real quick. It's not zero now. There are some sites for RVs right now. But we're talking At about Cape and State Park. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So uh, NIMBY, not in my backyard, is we've seen it with, with Rockwell. We've seen it with a number of, of industries that are coming in. Anybody who lives next to Bill? <laughs> Anybody who lives next to Bill? <laughs> And we always we always justify the the construction of the the factory or whatever because it brings a, a positive economic impact to the area. At Cape and State Park, um, 350 new units. I don't. I just do the math in my head. Um, it's that's not going to have that big an impact, but it will have a huge impact on the environment into which it's it's being located and on the the infrastructure that leads there. So. I don't, I don't know. I think this is the kind of thing that really should be left to the locals who were there 
and to make the decision because it's going to be their front yards that are shrunk by the expanding roads if that's what we're going to do. It's going to be their views that go away and are replaced with with the um, the, the the toilet stations and, and all of that. It's I think it's a difficult thing. It's a difficult sell for me for the legislature to say that, hey, you guys way over there have to do this because we think it's a good idea for your backyard. But if we True or false, if we let the vote on inconvenience only be taken by those who are inconvenienced, would we ever have anything in any place? But this fundamentally changes, as I understand it, this fundamentally changes that part of the park. You know, the, right. the reason people go to the park is, is unzipped by the presence of 350 RVs. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a city of RVs. Well, it depends, of RVs. On, depends on how big an area they're going on as well. Yeah, Yellowstone yeah. National Park, that's not a big not, deal. Not big at all. Yeah, that's right. Now, uh, it's, the park's not as big as Yellowstone, but if they're all concentrated in one small area, then it's going to be an obvious impact. If it's spread over the whole park. Well, what is it? Maybe Mike, it's, Larry, do we know? It's, it's largely <laughs> located up at the second lake, as I understand it. Uh, which is on top of a hill, kind of a unique spot that's very bucolic now. And a lot of people hike up there. They don't even take their car or ride a bike up there so they can sort of sit by the lake and listen to the birds and have this nice calm time. There's going to be water slides in that lake, and there's going to be uh, huge facilities and people everywhere. It will, I believe, change the nature of the way people enjoy the park now there's only 150 lodging spots in the entire park as we sit there now so 150 between the cabins uh the few rvs you're talking about i wasn't even aware there were any um but cabins and the lodge mm -hmm. if you go from 150 to 350 more sites means at least 700 more people. I don't know anybody who goes by themselves with a fifth wheel, right? Um, so, or some are families. Yeah. That's true. And so you're talking 700, 800 more people. And I don't doubt that there is a demand for it. The real question is, should it be on public ground or private ground? It's interesting. All three Republican commissioners in Morgan County signed a letter to the WVDNR telling them, we don't want this. Instead, there's a proposal for a park on private ground over the top of the mountain on the great Capen side of Capen Mountain. And we will, then that developer will provide a shuttle uh, to the, to the, to the uh, state park. But they will spend their time and live and all the sewage will be dealt with and the trash and everything else on private land. Do you know there's a petition against that one as well? Sure. Sure. And there are so. always there are gonna be some people in Morgan County who don't want it no matter what it is. Right, sure. And and uh, you'll get that. The question is what do most people want? When I see three Republican County commissioners in agreement with a fairly good sized swath, I know at the last protest meeting they had there was hundred and twenty five people who went up to the upper lake to protest. And so that's a lot of people in a place like Berkeley Springs. Um, by the way, the town of Bath has a population of 650 people. So we're literally talking about more people in the RV park than live in the town of Bath. Who signs off on this, Larry? Who make, who's the ultimate decision? WVDNR. They have the statutory authority now, uh, and they will be the ones who get to decide. I want to throw in a, before we go to you, Joe. I want to throw in a couple of texts that I just received from elected officials. One is from Delegate Paul Espinosa. To be clear, the previously enacted legislation simply allows public-private partnerships at state parks, not solely for the establishment or expansion of RV parks. Some parks already had public-private partnerships. The legislation allows other state parks to have them. And then this from Senate President Craig Blair. Uh, the 350 RVs are not happening. I asked how many is the right number. He said that's yet to be determined, but there's a real possibility of zero, Larry Schultz. So this may not be as big of an issue as you might have been led to believe. Well, I, um, I mean, I certainly hope uh, uh, Senator Blair is right, and I know uh, he's probably raised the hopes of a lot of people that I talk to and, about this. And I will um, concede that Senator Blair may know more than me. 
Oh. And that's technically more than I. So let's get our grammar right over there. Right. That didn't come from I, me. I, 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 <laughs> but you were, you were sitting there, grit, teeth gritted. Your teeth were gritted. Senator Blair doesn't know the me I say. <laughs> yeah, I was speaking Blairese there. <laughs> so let's go to – Craig, I'm trying to help you here, Craig. <laughs> let's go to uh, Joe, Joey Torch for ready. Well, I'm sure – not going to comment on who knows more, but uh, I, uh, economists talk about externalities, okay? When they, and, and in this era of public-private partnerships in these state parks, Paul Espinosa is right. Uh, the contracts we had privately for our parks previous to the 2022 legislation had to do with cleaning restrooms and things of that nature, you know, picking up trash and, and whatnot. This is a whole new ball game where we're going to have private businesses operating in our state parks and earning a profit by, as we were discussing here, enhancing uh, places where you can pull in an RV and, and basically stay for a while. Um, the externalities are uh, wherever people gather in numbers, there's a risk of conflict, right? I mean, we know that. That's just the way society is. Uh, is the legislature going to expect local law enforcement to suddenly start responding to more calls because we have more people gathering in these parks? Is Berkeley Ca or, um, Morgan County Sheriff's Department going to be able to do that? Um, and what about the accumulation of trash and everything else that now has to suddenly be picked up by some uh, organization? Uh, I don't know who does trash in Morgan County, but uh, I imagine it might be Apple Valley Waste. Uh, are they going to be able to handle this? And at what cost? And, so these externalities that the local community has to absorb in terms of, of having more police presence and all the other services that people demand, uh, I, I hope the legislature understands that uh, when you do these sorts of things, that uh, these local governments are going to need some help dealing with an influx of people. RV travel is way up because of COVID, and I, un I understand the need to respond to that, but we also have to make sure that our local governments and law enforcement folks have the tools to deal with the influx of people. Larry, final word is yours. Yes, the, these, the enabling statute we've been talking about is 20-5-16 of the West Virginia Code, and it's interesting. It gives the uh, uh, um, it gives the DNR the power to enter into contracts with third parties for the financing, construction, and operation of new recreational lodging and ancillary facilities. No mention of campground. Um, you know, that when I think of recreational facilities, I think of swimming pools and tennis courts. Um, lodging facilities, well, the campground, the person's bringing their own lodging. And so it's interesting that they didn't say campgrounds in the thing. Maybe that was... Um, deemed unnecessary, or maybe they didn't want to draw a whole lot of attention to what they were really talking about. I think there's at least a, a question there as to whether campgrounds are even covered by this. Um, and I suspect that someday some of those questions in the right state park will get answered uh, by a court. Um, Issue number five, the anchor leg in the traditional Mike Carl chair and the Mike Carl roll, John Gilstrap. Why, thank you, Robert. <clears throat> Within the last week or two, Joe Manchin went to uh, Ukraine along with Lisa Murkowski and Mark Kelly for what essentially looks to me like a photo op with President Zelensky. And they went there to show America's support for the Ukrainian struggle. And with the results of these leaked documents from the 21-year-old uh, Air Force kid, it's clear to me anyway that it, assuming that the leaked documents are, are in fact true, Ukrainians are running out of ammo. They are running out of guns that Russia will have air superiority within by, by mid-May. And I just question whether or not this is this effort, our effort in supporting Ukraine is not just prolonging the inevitable and costing a lot of lives. We've had people here in the audience, and Rob, I couldn't find her name, the young lady from Ukraine who, who came in and, and, and brought her Ma family. Marina. Marina. Marina McDonald. And I asked her, what does victory look like? And she said, it looks like peace. They just want to bring peace. You know, war is about body parts and blood and destruction and, and awfulness. And I'm afraid that, that we, Americans, the, the, the politicians are using this as a photo op and as a way to 
uh, score political points to make sure that Russia doesn't get the win, which I support 100%. I don't want to see Russia win this thing. I just think there comes a point from the point of, of showing mercy. Sometimes the right thing is is to let the inevitable happen and in the process perhaps preserve thousands of, of lives. 14 million Ukrainians have left Ukraine. Admiral Bill Stubblefield. Yeah, uh, a lot of folks are raising the same question. I, I'm going to invoke uh, uh, Mitch McConnell, uh, some of his statements, that it's not charity that we're investing in Ukraine. It's global security, and, uh, global security and democracy. He also said deterring Russian aggression has critical implications for peace and stability around the world. Uh, I'm of the camp, John, that uh, that we will if we get peace on a temporary basis it will be just strictly that temporary uh russia has made a a play now i think it's inherent upon the world to counter that play michael heights also a veteran so war is a very funny thing and you can say this is a conflict you can call it whatever you want it's this is war um people are dying and it seems like we're dying by uh, a thousand cuts here um my my opinion about war is you pick a side and you punch somebody in the mouth and that's the freaking end of it this this you know body punches body blows not nonsense it all it does is hurt everybody so if you're on the side of ukraine then go in there and Put the troops in, put the muscle in, and get the hell the, the Russians the hell out. And that doesn't just mean the United States. That means all of Europe, everybody that's that's on the side of Ukraine needs to go in and get the, the Russians the hell out. And if you're not, then stop sending them weapons and stop sending them ammo and, and stop talking about how you're for Ukraine. Do something or don't do something. But this little bit here and there doesn't help anybody. We're not helping Ukraine with what we're doing right now. If it's inevitable, then it's inevitable. And all we're doing is allowing Russia to take over Ukraine over a long period of time and, and causing misery, more and more misery in that area. So my opinion when it comes to war, make it short and sweet. Smack somebody in the chops. Mr. Schultz. Yes, um, the the woman that you spoke about earlier who says that, you know, victory looks like peace. Um, I'm not sure what she means about that uh, in the longer phase. In other words, peace, the end of hostilities there, could mean that the Russians begin to take every able-bodied Ukrainian man they can find and put him in a prison uh, located out near the old Chernobyl site. Um, that's peace. Nobody's being shot that we can see on TV. Uh, nobody's planes are being shot down, but it's not the kind of peace I would reckon that a, a person from Ukraine is looking forward to seeing happen. Um, we know enough about Putin to know that if he is, if he has the opportunity, he will ride roughshod over every Ukrainian person that he can find. It's not like Oh, there's a huge group of Ukrainians who want to be really want to be Russian, and we're setting them free. Every Ukrainian <laughs> wants to be a Ukrainian and wants nothing to do with Russia, and they're going to kill an awful lot of them if they win this war and torture them first. Yes, Joe Ferretti. Well, the other aspect to this is that the long game is China, because if Russia succeeds here, and if we pull back and don't assist the Ukrainians, there will be an assumption that we don't have the wherewithal to assist the Taiwanese either. And much like we kicked out the Iraqis out of Kuwait in the 90s over concerns about oil supply, the semiconductors that come from Taiwan right now, we are really dependent on those. And uh, if China takes over Taiwan, and they can easily uh, create a lot of problems by just sailing over what was a 40-mile wide, wide sea to get to Taiwan, uh, we got problems. 
And so the long game here is not only trying to expel Russia from Ukraine, but also to let the Chinese know that this country has the wherewithal and has the political backing to make sure that these countries stay in line. And so I, I think when you see what's happened with Finland joining NATO now and, and some reported inner turmoil amongst the Russians themselves as to how this war is going, uh, yeah, it's costing a lot of money and it's costing a lot of blood and, and soil, but uh, it is something that, uh, unfortunately, in geopolitics, we have to look at seriously, and uh, it, it extends, unfortunately, beyond just Ukraine, and I think it extends to Southeast Asia, and I think that's where our eyes are, too. All right, Joe, thank you, and I don't have time for the final word from you, uh, John, but I do have time for final thoughts. You get eight seconds apiece coming up after the break. Eight seconds apiece. Joe Ferretti, we begin with you. I'm hoping somebody can explain to me what's going on between the Ravens and Lamar Jackson. <laughs> I, I can't, so. <laughs> Larry Schultz. Right now I'm having amnesia and deja vu at the same time. I, just I think I've forgotten this before. <laughs> Bill Stubblefield. I've enjoyed the discussion with John Gilscrap today. Thank you for joining us, John. We're using All your, fair especially. We're using your character, by the way, on the TV as you talk. John Gilstrap. This afternoon I'm going with Matt Harvey to have my very first official West Virginia hot dog. Oh, very nice. Sarge. Thoughts and prayers go out to the mogul who is suffering right now from uh, a saw accident, uh, self-imposed. Dave Ramsey shows next. This is Talk Radio, WRNR Martinsburg and TV 10. Have a great weekend. We'll talk to you in 70 short hours. Talk somewhere.